So you just heard that the topic of my presentation is the mysterious birds. But now you may wonder what exactly I'm going to talk about. You've seen birds, like in your garden, on the sidewalks, or on your rooftops. But have you ever paid your full attention to them? Um, did you know that uh, human activities cause billions of bird fatalities each year around the world? Or do you know that light plays tricks to your eyes when it comes to bird feathers? Or, um, so if you are sensitive to colors, you'll notice that the colors of bird feathers could change depending on which angle you see or enter what light source. Mammals' first can never be like this, and it doesn't look anything like feathers. It's amazing, right? But no hurries, I'll explain it later. So here I'm going to talk about the main focus of my portfolio. The ultimate goal of my advanced study this year is to raise people's awareness of how beautiful birds are and to urge more people to protect them. I also addressed several existing problems through art. I hope people would start to take these problems more seriously. So here comes the first section of my portfolio. Okay. The beauty of bird feathers. This is the first half of my portfolio and I explored the amazing colors of bird feathers. Actually, in half of the artworks, there are no birds present in a painting. I don't want any definitive forms to limit the expressiveness of colors. So here are the first two pieces I created for this year. If you've seen my art before, you'll notice the differences between these two and my previous works instant instantaneously, because these are abstract arts. And what I created before were all realistic arts. So the reason I did this was to push myself uh, to uh, out of my comfort zone and try more bold moves, bold moves. I wish to do a more symbolic approach of birds so that even if a person doesn't like birds could appreciate the brush strokes or the colors of these paintings. And I've never done abstract art art before. And this is really challenging to do it at first. I have to admit that all of it looks easy to do. It is really art. It, it is really hard. So the technique I used was batik painting. So what is batik painting? Batik is an Indonesian technique of wax resist dyeing applied to the whole cloth. So um, when you try to create a batik painting, you first apply wax on fabric. It is just like the normal painting process, but in reverse ways. When you paint whatever you want to the fabric, uh, the areas covered by the wax will not be colored. They will remain white. And after you finish the painting, you will leave it to dry up. Then on the next day, you put the fabric on cardboard or old newspaper and use an iron to melt away the wax. And personally, this is my favorite step. But uh, there's uh, one thing to be careful about is that when you, you are using newspapers, you do not use any colored newspapers. And here's the reason. On the left piece, the blue one, um, on the right, right bottom corner, Here's um, here's a like a distant yellow color, and it is the color being transferred from the newspaper to the fabric. And uh, after I found found this out, I cannot do anything to fix it. So in the next piece, the, this one, I used uh, black and white newspapers. And these two are on um, the first one is uh, I used the blue and the black colors to represent kingfishers. And the second one, I used warm colors like red, pink, and um, pink and black to represent the flamingos. I also did more abstract, abstract arts by using another medium, the acrylic. 
So this piece is representing a phoenix rising from ashes. I used the canvas and the acrylic paint. Actually, this piece was created out of an accident. And um, it, since it is the first abs acrylic abstract piece I did in my life, I have no idea what to do at first. I just randomly spilled uh, some yellow and brown colors to the canvas and tilted up the canvas so that uh, it may flow freely. And in the end, it created a horrendously ugly picture. I was about to discard it, but uh, my hand just randomly knocked down a red bottle of paint. And I thought, why not try it out? So I painted some red on it and tilted the canvas again for it to flow. And it ended, ended up like this. And I think it is not bad. Yeah, so I keep it. So after like dozens and hundreds of failures and practices, I've I think I've mastered the technique of acrylic abstract painting. And these two pieces were my favorite. So I've got a question for you all. Just by looking to these two pictures, what do you think it is? Anybody volunteers? Yeah. Yeah, you can talk. Yeah, I cannot see you clearly, but you can talk. Yeah, the picture is just too small. We have one guest, Maggie, a peacock. And yeah, yeah, sure. A hummingbird was the other guest. A hummingbird. Wow, that's a good guess. Any <laughs> other, <laughs> any other like participants? Okay, oh, sorry, I accidentally clicked it. Okay, so here's the answer. It is actually, yeah, it is the hummingbird. Yeah, so here. Yeah. So um, I would like to take a chance to tell you something more about hummingbirds after this piece. So, Hummingbirds are the smallest bird in the world. They cannot walk, but they are the most professional flyer among all birds. They drink nectar with half of their body weight each day, and hummingbirds are really aggressive. Male, male hummingbirds will fight each other to death if no one is. They also have tongues like woodpeckers. It starts from their nostril and wraps around their skull. And here's the picture of it. It's strange, right? Nature is really weird when it comes to these little creatures. So let's see a YouTube video. It is a great YouTube video. The hummingbird and the flower. It's a perfect pair. Wait a second. Can you all hear the voice? We can hear it, but we couldn't see the video. Maggie. Oh, you could. What? Couldn't see. Okay, let me just adjust the settings real quick. Okay, okay. There. Can you see it now? Is it sharing the video? I'm gonna play it now. Can everybody see the video? Uh, no response? Yes. Okay, okay, sure, thanks. Just look how the long slender bill matches the shape of the flower. But as anyone with a popular hummingbird feeder knows, these birds are also furious fighters.
The Aztecs knew it. Their god of war was a hummingbird. The warriors were known to wear their feathers into battle. They were so on target. Scientists working in Colombia have found that for some of these birds, evolution has actually turned their beaks into swords. To study these birds, researchers set up high-speed cameras in the rainforest. They recorded interactions that looked like dueling fences. The hummingbirds had some pretty good moves. There's the stab, where the bird charges its rival like a jousting knight, or the feint and parry where the birds fight it out beak to beak until one tosses the other aside. And of course, the pinch and pluck, where the birds use their strong bills to bite and rip out feathers. All hummingbirds fight, but in these birds, the males had beaks that had been radically reshaped. These were thicker, more rigid, often hooked at the end, and in some cases, they had jagged points like rows of teeth. These weaponized bills were much less efficient at feeding. The hooked bill and the serrations both interfered with the tongue. But then again, a weaponized bill allowed the males to control access to the flowers. It doesn't matter how well you drink, you don't let anyone else near the nectar. At one time, it seemed like bill shape was all about matching the flower. Now, it's pretty clear, a bird does not live by nectar alone. Okay, so let's go back to the PowerPoint. So uh, this is another piece I did. And um, here's uh, for another topic that birds feathers are iri um, birds feathers are ir iridescent and uh, they look different they look like different colors from each angles. So this is a piece that I experiment the combination of digital drawing with British traditional drawing. Um, the sword and the gem are painted on drawing pad, but the claws are painted on paper. So, and one more thing, the claws are not all black, and if you observe them close enough, you see they reflect different hues of blue and purple from different angles. I chose to paint the ruby because red will look perfect when paired with black and blue. Red is a warm color, so if you want your painting to be not too dim, you add some red or yellow, depending on the theme. And I've gave you some seconds to see this work. Yeah, this is one of my favorite, actually. So let's move on. Here's the inspirations behind this work. Yeah, and I also did some other gym-centered painting. And on the left, here is a bird of paradise standing on a, like, a purple jewel. And on the right, here is a pigeon. The pigeon are, uh, male pigeon are famous for its neck and um, the purple, violet, and uh, green, green neck. And it is, uh, it is really special because of its coloring. And here I'm going to explain why it is so special. So here's the, I'm going to in introduce the concept of iridescent colors. Iridescent colors are colors that change depending on the angle of illumination or observation. And this specific picture, picture reminds me of jewelry. So I did the previous works. And got another video, just too many good videos. Yeah. So I'm going to wait a second. Grammarly does more than catch errors. With Grammarly, you can find really good, no, perfect words that make your writing sharp. I'm going to show you a secret. 
birds, animals, and people all have microscopic tricks that make them look different than they are. My name is Steve Bush, and I'm going to introduce you to a secret world that's hidden all around us. Prepare to learn about the secrets of color created by shape. Birds have different pigments in their feathers. Red, yellow, orange, black, and brown are all pigments, but there's colors which use more unusual methods to appear. Blue. This feather looks blue, but there are no blue pigments in it. There's no blue chemical. So if you look through the feather at a light, the blue disappears. Instead of a blue pigment, these feathers have small air bubbles that are just the right shape on the nanometer scale to reflect only blue light. We'll talk about how that works in a second, but just take that in. When you look at the bright blue feathers of a blue and gold macaw, the bird's feathers are actually pigmented dark gray, the color you see when you hold it up to a light, and there's a layer of bubbles that make the bird look blue. This is not just true in parrots. There is no blue pigment in any bird in the world. Bluebirds, blue jays, peacocks, parrots, every single blue feather you've ever seen has some trick based on the shape of the feather that makes it look blue. Now let's talk about how that works. As the feather forms, there are tiny, tiny drops of water mixed in with the protein of the feather the water evaporates and leaves air bubbles behind. It's similar to this sheet of bubble wrap. Imagine this is the surface of a blue feather. There's air bubbles and there's spaces between them. The bubbles are a mix of different sizes, mostly spherical and most importantly, are just under 500 nanometers apart on average. The average distance is the key because that is the exact color of light which will be reflected. Larger air bubbles reflect darker shades of blue because the average distance between them is shorter, which equals a darker blue. Smaller air bubbles reflect lighter shades of blue because the average distance is longer or lighter blue. Why does a field of air bubbles reflect the wavelengths that equal the average distance between them? We'll have to cover that some other day because honestly, I don't understand. It's the way the universe works. If you understand physics, please get in touch because I'd love to learn. You'll notice that the feather has dark gray pigment in it. This gray pigment absorbs every kind of light that hits it. But we know the blue has already bounced off the air bubbles, so the gray pigment is absorbing every color except blue, because the blue already turned around and left. This makes the blue way more vibrant. Here's a structural blue feather without the dark gray pigment. Kind of meh. Oh yeah, there's one more thing to say about blue. There's several more ways that shape can make stuff look blue, but only one other is used by birds as far as I know. That's to use thin, transparent films of just the right thickness. I don't want to overwhelm you by explaining two things in a row, but you can tell the difference by looking at them. Feathers that use air bubbles look blue from any angle. Feathers that use transparent films will be bright, even metallic blue from one angle but look black from other angles. Green. Now that you understand blue, or at least you understand that blue is a trick, green is easy. 99% of green feathers are just a structurally colored blue feather with some yellow pigment on top. Just like you learned in primary school, blue plus yellow equals green. Done. You're a world-class expert on green feathers now. But what if part of this green system breaks down? What if the structural blue is missing or the yellow pigment? This happens sometimes. Bajerigars are naturally green, but babies are sometimes born that are blue or yellow. Now that we know how green is formed, we know what happened. Bluebirds are missing their yellow pigment 
and yellow birds are missing their air bubbles. It's that simple. 100% of blue feathers are structurally colored, but there's an exception in green feathers. The taracos, which are fruit eating birds native to Africa, actually produce a green pigment in their feathers that is based on copper. That's the only exception though. Every other green feather is a structural color. Why? Why do birds go to so much trouble to produce nanoscale shapes in their feathers? Why don't they just make blue or green pigment? Is it for camouflage? Truthfully, we don't know. Our best guess is that blue pigment in birds, mammals, and reptiles just never developed. There's zero blue pigments in any bird, mammal, or reptile as far as we know. But blue and green are great camouflage in trees, so animals that have those colors are more successful at hiding. More ability to hide from predators equals more offspring equals more green feathers. White. Oddly enough, white is also a structural color. There's channels and cracks in the protein of the feather that reflect all light, making it look white. The way to understand this is to think of how clear water freezes into white snow. The chemistry of the water doesn't change, but the shape does, and that makes it reflect differently. So next time you're out and see a blue jay or bluebird, you can look the bird in the eye and say, I know your secret. You know that their feathers are colored by shape, not by pigment. And then you can turn to the person next to you and introduce them to this crazy hidden world that's in plain sight all around us. I hope you enjoy that experience. Go spread the word. Before you go, subscribe to learn more about what makes life awesome. Thanks for stopping by. Okay, that's a great video and let's go back to the presentation. So, oh yeah, before I go back to the presentation, I would like to show you guys how that actually works. I've got a blue feather here and a peacock feather here. So let's try and see if the blue color will actually disappear if there's a light. So I've got a flashlight and I put it behind. You can see, can you see the Blue is fading. Yeah, there's, yeah, it is no blue and it is the structural color. And yeah, the, the, the man also talk about the gray pigment and here's the gray pigment. It makes the blue stand, stands out even more. Beautiful colors. And here's the peacock feather. Just put the light, light through. You can see the color is fading away. Yeah. Yeah. So it really works. And yeah. And I'm gonna go back to the PowerPoint now. Yeah. The reason why after I knew this, I think about jewelry is that the gems like ruby or crystals they are actually also a structure colors. The, uh, like the ruby, they only reflect red light so that it looks red to our eyes. And I think it is really interesting to explore the similarity between bird and gins. Yeah. And um, let me go to the next part of my presentation. Bird coaching. Okay, this comes to the sad part. Look at that poor board. Okay. So, here is another piece of art I did. And uh, the main character in this piece is a uh, wallcrapper. And I chose wallcrappers for two reasons. First, they are really, really amazingly beautiful birds. And um, secondly, they also really look like the, let me see here. They look like the monarch butterfly. 
And I would, which is also like always fallen victim to things like spider webs. So that I think I would explore their uh, similarities and uh, the symbolic meaning between these two creatures. Let's go back to it. So this piece is an abstract representation of bird who has fallen victim to nets. There are millions of birds being caught because of nets each year. And porters usually set nets among birds' migration routes, which, which, is, which makes me really angry because birds, they migrate for millions, millions, not millions, sorry, thousands of miles. And just for, um, just for raising your offsprings or just to survive. And these people, they just set up in their migration routes and catch them. And more than 50% of birds caught on the net died of dehydration or physical injury before anyone noticed. So in order to gain a lot of financial profit, they, catch, they, they killed so many birds in the process. And here is, uh, here is a documentary of that. Sorry. Here. It's about China bird poaching. Local bird group takes on poaching in Beijing. It's early morning on the outskirts of Beijing and Gu Xuan is on the hunt. He's not looking for animals though. His prey is bird poachers. Xuan's part of a small group of volunteers in the city helping local authorities protect China's wildlife. <laughs> he films what he calls his sting operations. It's evidence to show the police, he says, and spread the word online. On this occasion, he says he found a man with a trap. <laughs> Put it down, he tells him. The police are coming. I found a lot of traps set up for birds, especially during the migration seasons in the spring and autumn. Birds can't really see them, though, so a lot of them are caught. I feel sorry for them, so I try to remove the nets and ask local law enforcement for help. China's a major stopover for tens of millions of birds migrating between the Arctic and places like Australia. Conservationists say poaching is endangering some of those species. Over the past three years, Xuan says he's tracked down countless poachers. <laughs> Terry Townshend's also been helping step up patrols. Yeah, I found a, a poacher uh, trying to catch birds uh, very close to my apartment uh, near the airport. I, I took down the nets and released the birds and I reported it to the police. And so they, they put up a notice, a public notice, uh, all around the area saying, you know, this is the migration time and uh, we must protect the wild birds. You know, if you see any activity, uh, poaching activity, then please call the police and we will respond. Offenders can face hefty fines and even prison, but despite tougher law enforcement, locals say migratory birds are still flying the gauntlet in China. Once captured, the birds often end up in cages or on the dinner tables of the rich. And while China's appetite for other things like ivory is well documented, along with the impact it has on animals, just how many birds are caught by poachers each year is unclear. Activists estimate that number is in the millions. Xuan says many birds end up being traded at markets. They're also sold on Chinese social media platforms and e-commerce sites. A pristine male... Siberian ruby throat or blue throat. And these are very pretty songbirds. So they sing quite well and they also look very good. And these birds can fetch, if they're in really, really top condition, can fetch around 20,000 uh, pounds per bird, which is around 25 to 30,000 uh, US dollars. To help protect the birds full time, Schwen crowdsources a small income. He's now asking more volunteers to join the front line against poaching even if Beijing's just one small battleground. Samantha Vardis, TRT World, Beijing. Okay. So this is uh, what, um, what porters do. Usually they set up the net on first major uh, migration routes and bird were, would be caught and sold on the market. Most bird would like died during the process, which is really sad. And so I did this piece just to 
tell people that, oh, do not do this, and it's really harmful to birds as well as the environment. Oh, there are such amazing creatures, and we should not hurt them. And in this piece, this is about, oh, this in this piece, um, I was more in my comfort zone because I used the watercolor and it is a realistic painting. And uh, in the back, I used a pencil to outline the a dream catcher. Uh, we, I was planning to draw the real net, but I um, changed to a dream catcher because it is more arti artistic ability. And a dream catcher always have feathers on it. So I think it's a, it is a great representation of the birds that died on the net, yeah. And here it comes to another type of art, the 3D design. This is the first piece I did using a 3D design. And it is also the first time I ever tried of doing something like this. The pieces depicts the scene of a bird injured from, by a bullet and falling down from the sky. I used LED lights as, a, as well as red strand paper to make the background and used a wood frame to make it to just to frame it. And I carefully arranged the feathers on top of it. The feathers are from uh, my personal collection and they are feathers I picked up from the street around all the places I've been in the world. I've, I've been doing this throughout my life and I've collected dozens of bird feathers from each species. Um, bird feathers are really hard to collect because they are you, you don't see them often and I just I don't know why maybe the nature is too big you know the world is too big so um, there is another piece I did this is more soft colors and using other types of feathers so here are what it looks like when three pieces are put placed together the other two white pieces are uh, more soft colors like a nest. I hope to use uh, this uh, white lighting to create a dreamy side and uh, using those fluffy feathers to represent the feathers that uh, parent birds put usually put in their nest. I choose the topic of nest in these two pieces because um, during, uh, especially in spring seasons, like right now, there are just so many people, they went into the woods and uh, steal baby birds from their nests. Um, so raising up a baby bird could um, prevent the bird from like scaring you. So many people would choose to raise a baby bird instead of buying an adult bird. That is why the, uh, the, the black market of baby birds were still really active and people were getting many profit from it. Um, so I have to add, say that uh, there is a really strict law against the poaching in China, but however, the poaching activity not, ne never dies out because there are just so many profit in it. Just like the average trade. And I would uh, like address the kingfisher craft. The kingfisher craft is one of the ancient Chinese traditional gold and silver jewelry manufacturing base. The beautiful blue colors you can see here on the pictures are actually kingfisher feathers. However, in order to obtain the feathers in its best quality, uh, once captured, the kingfisher will be instant, uh, instantly killed. A complete jewelry like this would take use up 40 to 80 kingfishers. And in ancient times, kingfisher feathers uh, beauty cannot be imitated so like um, the emperors or really rich families would want such jewelries using kingfishers. But however, now modern technology is capable of mimicking their unique color, but still there are people making it because of it can sell a really high price. Um, so I'm, I'm all against the, the use of kingfisher feathers. Uh, the technique is itself is worth to be passed on because it is um, a really 
、um, Asian craft of China. But however, we should use、um, substitute materials like a, a dyed goose feathers or some、um, um, plastic, like dyed plastic, but not the actual kingfisher feathers. Here is another topic.、Uh, I explored how natural disaster and its influence on birds.、Um, so there were millions of acres of bird habitat are lost or degraded every year due to development, agriculture, and、uh, forest practices. This piece is another abstract acrylic art、uh, created by me, and it is inspired by the news of Australian wildfire. On the bottom of this piece, you can see the red and black, and it is re it represents the scorched、um, scorched forest and the ongoing wildfire. And on top of the this piece, there is the barren ground and some、um, some flora and some woods growing out here. And these white these white patterns are a flock of birds ex escaping the site. So in the in these three pieces, I addresses the influence on bird by global warming. So um, the these three pieces allude um, here are some just they are they represent the feathers, but they also represent the melted ice as you can see. Ah,、uh, these are the pieces were created using a different technique. Instead of painting on the canvas, um,、uh, I actually painted on clear um plastic, and uh, then I took the canvas and pressed canvas to that plastic, um, so that it created more smooth patterns. Um, later I could、uh, spill some white ink on it, like the middle pieces and the first one, and the third one is actually. Um, even more different, because I painted the canvas,、uh, like painted the whole canvas gold at first, and then add, I add the acrylic colors on it. So actually, the gold edges are、uh, the vacant areas of this painting. Um. So here's another um picture against. Approaching.、Uh, this is a watercolor piece I drew, and、um, the so the red target line is representing a person is aiming a shotgun to this bird. The bird the bird's name is the Bali Mina. There are only no more than thirty individuals of it currently live in the wild. Mina is one of the most commonly captured wild birds. Just because they can imitate your voice, so they are just like parrots. When you like, when you talk to them, they can talk to you back.、Um, I did this piece to tell how endangered a bird species could be. This piece is called Heart.、Um, it represents an eagle was、um, was being shot and was falling down from the sky. There are people who hunt wild birds during the, their migration seasons. During these seasons, birds travel thousands of miles, and they are extremely exhausted when they took a break. These birds are easier to catch, and poaching had、uh, always been a really serious issue. In this piece, I used I did not use any watercolor. I used ink instead, the red ink and the black ink. And I use also use some acrylic to outline the gold. It turns out to be one of the more different pieces by、uh, created by me, and I kind of like how it turns out. And here we comes to the end of my presentation. So you can see there are some sketches by me during this year. On the right, there is、uh, the sketches.、Uh, some I I sketched some ideas for the jewelry and bird portion, and on the left there are some 
more colored pieces, but they were discarded for some unknown reasons. Maybe I just doesn't like how it turns out. Yeah, I just didn't finish it. Maggie, we have some time for questions too when, when you have time. Oh, okay. So here is really, it is really the end of this presentation. So just we can go through this. You can, you can finish. You still have time. Oh, it turns out. Oh. And here is also a study of Google's. In case you are curious, here's the process photos of my paintings. These more process photos. On the left is the acrylic paint, and on the right is the, the uh, wax paint. Yeah, here are more process photos. I also did an online exhibition at French Contemporary Art Association last semester. And um, yeah, this is the poster of it. Uh, too bad it, the, the exhibition has long ended, so I couldn't show you the website. But yeah, it contains some, some of my current works as well as my past works. Yeah, okay, here's the Q&A session, and you are free to ask any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Which one was your favorite piece to make, Maggie, out of all of them? Oh, my favorite piece. Wow, that is a hard question. But I can tell you there were two, my, two of my favorite. I really like the wildfire one, that one, and also the wall creeper one, like the two, two butterfly bird with the dream catcher. Yeah, these two, I, I like them the most. Okay. Um, Miss Thompson, can you yes. help me repeat the here? Most interesting thing you learned during the project. Ah, oh, the most interesting thing. Okay, so um, I've learned a lot during this advanced study like how to paint abstract art, which I never did before. It was crazy and I now I love it. And um, also I, I know that um, some bird feathers have, um, they change from different angles of light and their colors are not the real colors. But actually I did not know that birds does not have blue pigment. This is the thing I found out during my during the process, and I was shocked, and I couldn't wait to share this information to all of you. Yeah. Maggie, when did you first become interested in birds and why? Oh wow. I I could I really couldn't tell. Like since I could remember things, I I love. I love birds and it's like an instant instinct to me. Or uh, maybe it was because um Chi there were two mysterious creatures in in Chinese culture, the dragon and the phoenix. And I really like the phoenix because it's so beautiful. And uh, that caused me to um uh, look up to phoenix and to birds. And then I realized there are such amazing creatures with so many mysteries and secrets, and I just couldn't help but fall in love with them. Maggie, do you do any bird watching? Uh, a bird what? 
bird watching? Is it something? Oh, yeah. I I I always do bird watching. Yeah. Uh, like um, it is not really it's it is not a really easy task when I was back in my city because it's a really uh, modern city. I live in the downtown, so there isn't a lot of birds. But I still got I've been keeping track of a group of wild mina like for three or four years around my neighborhood. And they were really interesting to watch. And they sometimes they fight with uh, magpies. There were a group of magpies and group of mina. And uh, I'll, I've always taken like hundreds of thousands of bird pictures. Uh, I've went to the inner Mongolia once and I took a picture of a queen and which is a really rare bird. And I was so glad I got to see it. Uh, um, I, hear that one, Maggie? What, yeah, I, I did not. Can you repeat it? What medium is your favorite to use when painting birds? Of course, it will always be watercolor. I just love watercolor and um, birds' feathers. As you can see, here's an owl feather, feather I bought from Japan. There was an owl cafeteria in Japan, which is really fun. Just Everybody just go to Japan. Japan is a really good place to play, good place to go. Okay, so you can see the feather is transparent. Watercolor most distinct feature is its transparency. So when I was painting the bird feathers, I can see that watercolor is one of the best ways to paint it. How, all right, I have a question, Maggie. How yeah. how was the transition for you to go from um, AP art with the structure versus um, moving into advanced study and you having to pace yourself and, and motivate your, your own work? Um, AP, during my um, experience in AP Studio Art, like everything was really uh, structured and planned for me. So there isn't any worries for me to uh, catch up the deadlines because I have a uh, school time to work work my arts. And I also have a really centered central topic so that I can work from. Um, this year's advanced study, however, I admit that I've met some difficulties. First, I had difficulties with uh, setting up a central theme. And also I, I wish to uh, improve my drawing skills by uh, stepping out of my comfort zone and um, the uh, abstract art it I really it really took me some time to decide to try it because I was afraid I wouldn't be good at it and um, keeping motivated throughout this class this year was um, not easy because I um, uh, I admit that I hate virtual school and staying at home all the time throughout this year. Yeah, it's crazy. I've been staying at home for a year and it's really hard to stay motivated all the time. Sometimes you just doesn't want to do anything. I just laying on the bed or laying on your bed or just watching YouTube channels, <laughs> doing nothing, uh, even if you know you have things to do. So... Uh, when I when I lost my passion, I would just go to um, go to the uh, Instagram or go to Twitter, uh, to uh, find those uh, people who create artworks. There are just so many great artists around the world, and they they post their works on the internet. When you see it, you just you can learn so much from them, and you will become so like inspired and. Uh, like personally, after I saw something like really triggers my passion, I would just uh, start to do uh, artwork right now. Yeah. And that is how I push myself to do this. Yeah. Thank you for sharing, Maggie. I know we all need to hear a 
Are there any last Okay, let's give her a round of applause. Thank you, thank you.